Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. I have a great show for you today. Many of you didn't see when we interviewed Ted Howard. I think you're going to get a treat out of it. And secondly, remember that guy who wrote that book about Trump? We have him as well, author of uh, The Tribalization of America, Ian, uh, Ian Reifowitz. I think you're going to love those two interviews. But before we get started... I went and I did my job today. I early voted here in Texas, and I'm pretty sure most of you know who I voted for. It was the lines were long. I asked the person if the lines were this long all week. They said no, but since today's the last day of early voting, it was very, very long. It was a very long morning. I had to go out there and um, do my regular tests for uh, blood pressure, and of course, I had to go get my, you know, they do those, those kind of blood things on you. So it's been a long morning and I spent an inordinate amount of time out there, much more time than I should have, mostly because, again, we had to wait. But anyhow, what's going on today? Folks, tomorrow is South Carolina. Do not make whatever the outcome of South Carolina is change the trajectory of our thought process with where this election is going. South Carolina is sort of a, I don't know how to explain it. But I am, I am disappointed that many of the voters in South Carolina uh, pretty much vote. Well, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. Anyhow, uh, so we have the vote in, in South Carolina. The coronavirus, Donald Trump has set up his vice president for the fall. And I think what he's going to do in the long run is when this stuff gets out of control, blame it on the vice president, Get a, 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 consider getting a new running mate and push some excitement into his campaign. And what's going to happen is people are going to say, oh, well, yeah, I guess it was the vice president who screwed up. And the president, the assertive president, did something good about it. And he went ahead and got rid of that lousy vice president and brought in some fresh meat, somebody we can vote for. I don't know. I just, I just thought it strange for the president to uh, assign this to the vice president. I think the vice president is on shaky ground to view. If you want to, (laughs) I think the vice president is on shaky ground. So anyhow, check out these two uh, interviews. They are great. I think you're going to enjoy them. Welcome to another edition of Politics Done Right. I'm here today with the one and only Ted Howard, who is president of, president and co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative. And now he's the he's also the well we know him as the author of several books, the author of several articles, but today he's here to talk to us uh, not only about the economy but about the making of a democratic economy. Ted Howard, welcome to Politics Done Right. Thank you so much, Egberto. Real pleasure to be here. I'm honored. Absolutely. So I'm honored to have you. First of all. I don't have the hard copy of your book. You know, I, I want, I'm trying to save the forest, okay? But I know you have a hard copy. Why don't you show us what it looks like? Yeah, let me just hold it up here. Oh, there the we go. The other side, the other side. Yeah, there you go. There yep. you go. That's the book. The, the making, making of a democratic of, economy. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, but you know what, Howard, before we, I mean, Ted, before we get into the book, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the state of our economy. Uh, generally speaking, how would you describe what we're living in right now? Well, it depends who you ask. Now, if you ask uh, the president of the United States, he points to, boy, the stock market's never been higher. Uh, the gross domestic products going through the roof. Everything's grow, grow, grow. I saw him the other day. He said uh, because of his tax cuts, people are just filled with cash in their pockets. Well, that's that view. Here's the view that I think is more realistic. 47% of the American public, our families, can't assemble $400 from their paychecks in order to meet a basic need they have, like maybe a kid breaks a leg or their car breaks down or their roof needs to be repaired. In the most productive economy in the history of the world, 47% of our people can't put together $400. Three people, just three people in this country, and your listeners will know their names well, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett, own more wealth than the bottom 160 million of us. In other words, half the country 
has less wealth than three people. The concentration of wealth is becoming ever more greater. It's escalating. It's been particularly escalating since President Reagan in the early 1980s and in the United Kingdom, Margaret Thatcher, with their what's called the neoliberal agenda. Uh, agenda. And so I would say that we have an economy, uh, to quote Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel laureate economist, mm -hmm. um, of, by, and for the 1%, and it's getting worse and worse. The, the, the wealth ownership pattern in this country is akin to what it was in medieval feudal Europe back in the 14th century. So that's the reality. I think we've got an economy that's very productive, but it extracts wealth from our economies and it centralizes it in fewer and fewer hands. And I think that's a tremendous jeopardy for the future of democracy as, as a principle in this country. You know what is interesting, uh, Ted? Uh, earlier, I, I want to say two things first. Uh, earlier today on my show on KPFT, I, I was talking about this same thing, about the economy growing at 2% while the wealthy grows at north of 7%. That means it's extractive. You can only have a you can only have the wealthy grow at a larger rate than the economy, if they are taken away from everybody else. That's a mathematical fact. Now, I spoke to um, a, a, a caller today, and he said he looked around where he lives, and everything looked fine. So, to him, the urgency with which I was talking was a bit too urgent, if you know what I mean. In other words. Right now, a lot of people don't see the dire straits that we're in because they aren't specifically right, right there, there, but they don't quite understand that they're there. My question is, how are we going to get them to realize that Dr. Richard Wolf, I'm pretty sure you're aware of who he is, yeah. uh, he really taught me something, uh, not only in, in, a, in a couple interviews that I did with him, but in a speech that he gave where he showed that we used credit as a form of theft, wage theft in this country. And many people, because of the way it's done, they don't see it. So I'd like you to tie that together. How can we get people to understand the dire straits that they're really in based on the camouflage and the facade that they have on their own lives? Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point, because when you look at what's actually going on statistically, uh, the fact that our middle class and our working class are being hollowed out, uh, that, for instance, um, we cite in our, our book, The Making of a Democratic Economy, a, a public opinion poll that showed something like 70 percent of the American public, and that's a lot of Republicans, too, 70 mm percent. -hmm say the system is rigged against them and for the wealthy. In fact, I heard something on the news last night that figures up to something like 85%. Um, so you kind of look at that and, and, and you, you know, people are highly dissatisfied with a lot of what's going on in the country. And yet, you know, when you kind of look around, you know, the Walmarts are filled with lots of goods and people are going in there and using their credit cards and, so I, I think what really needs to happen here is a couple of things. One, we need to, uh, I don't know if you remember the film, The Matrix. Um, yes. I, I see actually they're making Matrix 4, Keanu Reeves, yes. like that. Well, the first one, which was the best one for sure. Mm -hmm. If you remember, it, everybody's living in this world and it kind of looks wonderful out there, except it turns out in that science fiction dystopia, um, the, the machines are controlling everybody and, you know, it's all a facade. And if you don't take the red pill, you'll never know that you're living in this craziness. And so, in a sense, we're kind of living in that sort of country and economy. And we need love to legitimize this, this, you know, this, this mythology that's taken. Right. And, and, you know, so most people just buy the idea. There are all these bromides that we hear that are not at all related to the truth, but people, you know, it's been said enough by the corporations and the politicians, people come to believe them. So people think, well, as long as the big economy's growing, some of it's gonna trickle down to the little guy and woman, you know, in most need. Well, it, it just doesn't, and the statistics show that. You, you hear, well, a rising tide will lift all boats, but not really. 
um, you hear as long as the stock market's going up, we're all benefiting. But but most people, even if they own a little bit of stock, it, it doesn't benefit them at all. It's the big institutional investor. And so it goes on and on. So the first thing I think we need to do is really come to terms with the emperor has no clothes or right. another harsher way to say it is we're all living in the matrix world and we need to deplug from it. You know, the challenge we face, I think, Egberto, certainly there's a big challenge of giant concentrated corporate power, wealthy individuals standing in the way of really progressive economic change away from what you've said, and we call in the book an extractive economy toward a democratic economy, and we could talk about that. So these big forces are in the way, but I think, having done this work for decades, the biggest challenge we face is it's hard to imagine we could actually live in another kind of system. Thank you. Know, you. Yes. You know, there's somebody said, um, and I forget who, uh, but it's one of my favorite quotes, that it's easier to imagine the end of our planet than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And that's mm -hmm. really true. I want to interrupt you for one second because, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head that is what a caller today said. He said, you know, we know we're gone. You know we can't change our current economic system. So let's pretty much appease. Let's just pretty much do the best we can. And my contention is, no, we can. I, I, I want to I kind of turn the trend here a minute because I gave an urgent to the, to the listeners today. And it was because of something that I saw on Facebook. I saw a, a Trumpster arguing with another person. Rather, I saw two friends arguing. One who had Trumpster friends, okay? And the other person said, go ahead and unfriend me because I can't deal with the friends that you have. And I jumped into the discussion right away. I, I said, like, no, 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 unfriend nobody. Unfriend nobody. We don't want that. First of all, it messes up with the algorithm because now it keeps you constantly in a silo, right? You only see things that you want to see, and uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't lend itself for the kind of work that you and I want to get accomplished, and that is for everybody to get together to go against the real, the real enemy, if you will. So I said, don't do that. Go ahead and just assume the other person has a mental illness, and you wouldn't treat anybody badly who had a mental illness. You would be... You would be sympathetic towards them. You'll be empathetic towards them. Try that. Because we have to communicate with each other. We have to continuously talk to each other. Because if we are talking, we can look at the real problem. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that's exactly right. You know, the, <laughs> um, uh, our organization, the, the co-founder of, is called the Democracy Collaborative. And part of the nature of this is we have got to be able to talk in a serious way based on facts and data about what's happening in our lives and what might be ways forward. This, um, you know, I, I live in Ohio mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it's a very interesting state. You know, when uh, Barack Obama first ran for president, Ohio voted for him. He carried mm -hmm. Ohio. Second time Obama ran for president, uh, reelected, carried Ohio. Trump comes along, Trump carried Ohio. And, you know, what's what's happening is we're getting so, you know, as they say on TV, so tribal and mm -hmm. so disconnected from one another that this notion of, of what has made America a viable experiment, and, and it has tremendous flaws, and we, all the way back to the original sin of slavery of 400 years this, this month, um, through so many problems, but it's been a viable experiment because we've been able to grapple together with our funds and find a kind of civic purpose. And it's one of the things about the economy now. Um, uh, my co-author Marjorie Kelly and I like to talk about a moral economy. You know, what are the values and principles of a, of a really moral economy? But what has occurred is the economy has been so... Uh, uh, dislocated from the lives of people that it's all just data and forecasts and numbers and we don't see that it's really about people. We've completely eliminated the human from the economy. 
So, so I agree with you. Um, rather than unfriend each other, what we need to do is start to get in a room and get really serious about what's happening. And, you know, I, I think, um, uh, you know, our book is meant not only for those that are critics of the president, and I count myself among the most ardent <laughs> critics, um, but for those who are supporters, let's look and see, you know, okay, you support this president. What have you got to say that since the Great Recession of a decade ago, 95% of all the income gains have gone to 1% you know, of the people? You know, the, we need to grapple with that. So I really think, you know, to uh, not go on and on, but, you know, this idea that we live in a system and we kind of get trapped thinking we really can't get beyond it. You know, you said their caller said, well, we need to appease them or whatever. But, you know, Egberto, if you and I lived 3,000 years ago in Pharaoh's Egypt, you know, which lasted like 2,000 years, I'm sure we would think, you know, the world will always have pyramids and sphinxes exactly. and pharaohs. And or if we looked in the Middle Ages, it's always going to be the, the church and the king and all the rest of us will be peasants and serfs. And now we study all that in the history books. And so what we're talking about is actually how do we move forward beyond this hyper casino capitalism that we live in into a new kind of economy that's neither the old style soviet state socialism bureaucracy that's highly undemocratic nor this extractive concentrated capitalism that's also highly undemocratic what's the alternative and that's what we need to build together and that's your book an economy of by and for the people so let's start there you're you have it well organized in chapters an economy of by and for the people uh in uh, tell and by the way folks we're now t uh, we're now talking about the making of a democratic economy uh by one and only ted howard and he has a co-author right yes marjorie kelly who's just an extraordinary thought leader has been working on issues such as democratic and employee ownership for decades. She's just a brilliant person. I, I ride on her coattails. Uh, well, great, great. I mean, you know what? We've been riding on women's coattails for a long time. Amen. <laughs> okay, so an economy of, uh, let's talk about that chapter, an economy of and by the people. Tell me what you mean by that. Well, what we mean is, uh, as I was saying, an economy that's very really designed to serve people, not is disconnected from the lived experience of people. And what we do in this book, we've got, we've identified seven principles of a mm -hmm. democratic economy or moral economy. And one of them is, you know, that it's an economy of the people. Another is that community needs to be at the center of an economy. For instance, the large corporations now, the big multinationals, um, uh, you know, they don't really, consider community to be important. They're, they're global, they're kind of footloose. Um, their principle has been and continues to be to maximize the value of the shareholders' interests. Um, and so, you know, for them, a community is simply a place from which wealth can be extracted. It's wow. not a place yes. to really build. You know, it, it's like, I live in Cleveland, Ohio. You know, there are big corporations there, but they don't really care about Cleveland. If they mm -hmm. can get a better deal and less taxes and fewer unions and all that by moving to Phoenix or moving to Mexico or moving to China, they'll go do it. And so these are the kinds of principles, you know, sus environmental sustainability is another principle of a democratic economy. Inclusion, you know, the fact that those, uh, that, that as an economy grows, everyone needs to benefit from it rather than the way we do it now. You know, I, again, in Cleveland, where I live, about a third of the population lives below the federal poverty line. Yeah. Yeah. So while the economy grows, it's leaving behind a third of the people, at least. And so these principles are, are at the heart of this book. But the thing I want to say, I'm not an economist. And I actually don't read many economics texts. I find them turgid and boring. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but what, so I want to say to people that don't worry if you don't know about economics, this can still be a book for you because really what we're trying to do is change the narrative, the story around the economy. And, and I so notice, 
I noticed that's what you did in the book. You created individual stories of people in each of these seven um, sequences. That's exactly right. So, and we tell stories. And so, for instance, one of the stories is about Cleveland, Ohio, where I've helped about a decade ago uh, uh, build a network of worker-owned cooperatives that are located in the lowest income neighborhoods in our city, intentionally hire people in the companies from those neighborhoods, uh, pay living wage, family supporting salaries, give very good health benefits, and also have profit sharing because the companies are owned by the workers in them. And the way they operate is they provide goods and services to the large, what we call anchor institutions, hospitals, universities, cultural centers that are in the city of Cleveland and don't get up and leave. And this is called the Evergreen Cooperatives. And so we tell the story of the Evergreen Cooperatives, um, not, from, not just from all the several hundred people that work in them, but from the eyes of one person who, when we first met him a decade ago, he was very entrepreneurial, but the entrepreneurship uh, he had is he was selling hard drugs right. and he can go of it. And then he'd been incarcerated and we brought him into the company. Um, we made him an owner of the company. He was an extraordinary employee and he learned the skills of work and everything. And now he's moved on to, to another kind of company. And it shows that, you know, their way to, to create a business that is really people centered, not just Profit now, let me ask you something Thank about you. that cooperative. Let me ask you something about that because yeah. that worked. It, it yeah. worked, uh, but in, when you start talking about employee ownership and cooperatives and so forth, the first hit you get in America is that is socialist, which it is, but they, they say it's socialist, right? And yeah. you, the, the next question that comes up, and what's wrong, is there something wrong with the mechanism that you just saw work? Right. Well, so this socialism thing is very interesting. First, I, I you know, I, I, I think Bernie Sanders has done a great service to America by calling himself a democratic socialist. Yes, and, you know, yes it's he not, has. It's not very scary, and here's what it's about. He's not shying away from it. But these labels are used, and of course the Republicans in this election are going to, you know, the Democrats could nominate the most conservative of the 20 people running. Right. And the Republicans are still going to call them socialists. But what does socialism in this sense mean? It means, it, it doesn't mean uh, that the state, the national the government. Me methods of production, the, right. It just means that we're advocating for broader ownership among different publics, if you will. So, so you know, em employee ownership could sound sort of socialistic. On the other hand, this is mind blowing to me. There are something like 8,000 companies and corporations in the United States that are employee owned. Mm -hmm. In other words, the people in them, uh, thousands of them are 100% owned by the workers. Sometimes they only own 20%, but they're employee owned. There are more people, 10 million people now in America, who work in employee owned companies that they own than are members of private sector unions. Wow. Things have changed. And, you know, that's 10 million people. And I'm telling you, these people are not all identifying as socialists. Right. But they like to work in a company where they have voice, participation, they share in the profits, they get to, like our evergreen cooperatives in Cleveland, the workers uh, have democratic elections to elect some members to the board so that they participate. You know, this is, in a sense, this can be as American as apple pie. And one of the very funny things, um, I, I could send you a link sometime if you're interested. Please do. I have a quote from a political figure in the early 1980s, a long speech actually going on and on about how the future of the American economy will be a future where the workers own the companies in which they work. And who said that? President Ronald Reagan. So if this is a, a left-wing socialist agenda, 
I guess we've got to say that President Reagan was, was a left-wing socialist. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he was the one that said it. He, he supported unions as well. He yeah. was the one, who, you know, so I mean, it's amazing the transition that we've made. Well, I mean, uh, so what else in your book that we can talk about that you think, uh, because you went ahead and called out just about every principle already, that uh, the, the seven principles. Um, well, I think one of my... Uh, uh, two stories that are really very, very interesting to me. And one is uh, a principle, this principle of community, really mm -hmm. reinforcing community. Uh, I've been privileged over the last years to uh, work with uh, indigenous people, Native Americans on the Pine Ridge Reservation of, mm -hmm. in South Dakota. And, you know, I was saying the, the poverty rate uh, in Cleveland is about 33%. And the unemployment rate in lower income communities is maybe 40%. Wow. Very tough. But on the Pine Ridge Reservation, which is the home of the Oglala Sioux, you know, who were forced there at the end of the Indian Wars. Right. Uh, the unemployment rate there is always between 80 and 85%, if you Whoa. can imagine that. So this is a place where people are, are in very dire circumstances and yet they they're they're tired they're, they're not waiting around for someone to do something they've started because they believe in their community a group of young very dynamic young sioux leaders men and women have started what they call a regenerative community to build the sense of community for their people they've got a a, a, a piece of land that's 35 acres uh they are building uh um housing uh, in the indigenous patterns and very environmental. Uh, they're starting to build light manufacturing that they'll own, their community will own, uh, cultural centers, schools, and so forth. And the way they're building it is rather than go off the reservation and hire, you know, a white construction company from Rapid City, you know, two hours away to come down and build things, the Sioux are, have begun a, what they're calling, a Native American worker-owned construction company. Wow. So they built their own cooperative to build their own community. And I think that's a beautiful story. The other story I tell you very quickly, so I don't run on. Um, I've been working in the United Kingdom, in England, with the Labour Party there. And, of mm -hmm. course, uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Right. Is, you know, in a sense, a kind of version of Bernie Sanders. Or Will maybe, he be prime minister? You know, as they say, inshallah, I hope so. Um, <laughs> uh, it looks like there's going to be an election, uh, yes. you know, maybe in October. Um, and I think there's a very good chance that he will be um, okay. the uh, prime minister. And um, he has embraced what we call in the democracy con collaborative community wealth building. It's really a way to build this democratic economy. And so we've worked with labor council members in city council in a town called Preston, which is 150,000 people. It's an older industrial. We call it in the United States a Rust Belt city. Mm -hmm. And it was really flat on its back when I first went there six years ago. And what they've done is they, the city council said, again, no one's coming to save us. We have to do for ourselves in our community. And what they've done is... Um, they, they persuaded the local university, the local housing authorities, even the police force to look at all the contracts for services and goods that they buy and notice which ones are going to France or going just to London, aren't creating economic value locally and move those contracts back into the city. And so they brought 70 million pounds, about $100 million of money that used to leave the system back into Preston. So that's wow. the then they worked with the local unions and have uh, access. I'll, I'll do this in dollars, about one hundred twenty five million dollars of public employee pension funds, which, again, used to leave Preston and now are being invested in Preston. They're building their own public bank so that they don't have to negotiate with the five right. big banks and the high interest rates. And they'll capitalize it with the reserves of the Lancashire County and the city of Preston. They're creating their own renewable energy company. The University of Central Lancashire Cashier, has a Lancashire has a uh, new unit to incubate cooperatives, worker cooperatives. Anyway, so you've got this whole new 
democratic economy being born in this in this city that when this began and this is the end of the story when this began six years ago preston was listed in a government index of of they call it the deprivation index if you can believe that preston was listed in the bottom 20 percent of the most deprived cities in all of england earlier this year there's a very radical socialist group you may have heard of price waterhouse coopers mm -hmm. uh, did a study and came and listed the most improved communities in all of england and preston was rated by price price waterhouse coopers as the number one most improved city for the residents of preston so what it shows is these principles if they're really implemented whether it's in Houston or Austin or Cleveland or Preston or, you know, South Florida, wherever, if they're implemented with real intentionality, even in this crazy national political time, you can still build a resilient local economy on a democratic basis. I think there's something very important that uh, you're pointing out here that, that, that probably going to go over the head of a lot of people. Uh, this city was depressed. This city was not only depressed, but uh, the capitalist model failed it. The capitalist model saw no value in it. That's People right. saw value in it, and they brought it back. In other words, all the capitalist companies, based on what you've just said, were extractive. They were taken out of this, this city. Even this dying city, they were taken out. The only difference you had is you removed... Those that were removing capital, you reinvested human capital, all that came from that community into that community, and it sprung up. That's that exactly. is actually socialism in a radically democratic form. That's right. We, and we, you know, we call it building prosperity for the many, not just the few. But the way you need to do it to make it really stick is you need to broaden ownership over the capital and the economy. It can't just be good guy programs and initiatives. The issue, what defines any community, what defines any country is who owns the assets and gets to determine how those assets are used. And they have a new model for that in the city of Preston. And you know what, Ted? Interestingly, it's not new. There is a, an activist in, I don't remember what ghetto here in the United States called, I think his name was Roy Innes or something like that, yep. that tried to implement ownership of these public buildings as well. And what they did notice with those experiments as well is the, the, uh, keep the interest in the building, keeping the building up, doing things with the buildings made a difference. Yes, yeah, this, this whole issue of, of democratic or broader or socialized ownership is, it's not a new idea. Right. However, it's an idea that's getting a lot of traction right now. So, for instance, um, uh, there is one public bank in the United States of America. It's North Dakota, right? North Dakota. So, you've got a socialized bank that is controlled by the state government. In a red state. In one of the most conservative red states there is. When you look at what took place 10 years ago with the financial collapse and the Great Recession, as credit dried up all over the country because the banks, you know, retrenched. Right. Um, Derivatives and the works, yes. Exactly. In North Dakota, because you had a socialized bank, the state kept lending to small business, to people, families that wanted a mortgage, and what, and kept the, the money flowing because they knew it would be in the interest of the state, of the people. And North Dakota weathered the recession better pretty much than any other state. But that model just celebrated several weeks ago its 100th birthday, and there had never been another public bank. But because of people now starting to examine what happened during the recession, there are two dozen states in the United States, including big ones like California, that are doing feasibility studies to establish their own public bank. And there are a couple dozen cities doing the same thing. Um, 
you know, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Cle uh, Washington, D.C., all over. So this is a way to for a community to control its capital and ra rather than being dictated to by the large banks. Ted, what we need is exposure. What we need is exposure because uh, everything that you just said, uh, these are known entities, in interestingly. The problem is, however, it is kept out of the eyes of many because uh, it's, it doesn't serve the corporate interests. So they don't want anybody to really get traction. North Dakota, all small state. Uh, California, those liberal wackos. But even, the, even a lot of folks in California and other places that we may consider, oh, these are Democrats, they must be progressives. They're right within the tracks, which means yeah. they're bought as well. Well, you know, well, you're right. Um, you know, when you look at whether it's a conservative news outlet or a liberal news outlet like the New York Times, and you read about the economy, you do not read about this. You exactly. don't read about this ferment of experimentation, innovation. You know, we, again, one of the myths that we have in our country is that public ownership is inefficient, doesn't work, and, everything, and everything's just been privatized. Well, if you look at uh, small communities all over the country, particularly in the South, um, you find uh, communities of, you know, 10,000, 20, 50,000 people that the large telecommunication companies don't see there's enough profit to extract. So they won't go in and build broadband networks and cable networks and so forth. So the city governments, this is a new trend, have been doing this all over the South and almost all of the mayors of these cities are Republicans. Yes. So, but, you know, they're not socialists, but they think it makes a lot of sense that the city government on behalf of the people should own this, uh, this, this, uh, you know, uh, asset. And, and it is in effect socialized. So you're quite right. What we need to do is, and we hope this book makes some contribution is tell the story that there is within the architecture of the giant capitalism we live in there i firmly believe there is a fundamentally different and new economy that's being born and we just need to keep advancing that that growth and telling that story that is the closer ted Ooh. howard president and co-founder of democracy collaborative author of The Making of a Democratic Economy. There it is. Get that book. It was my pleasure to have you on Politics Done Right, sir. Thank and you. I hope to see you again because we have so much more to talk about. Thank you, Edgardo. Very much appreciate it. And if you ever make it to the Midwest, come see us in Cleveland. I want to, I want to take you into the Evergreen Cooperatives and meet these extraordinary men and women that are, that are demonstrating that working people can own their companies and make them profitable, productive, great places to work. I'll be there. Good enough. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Ted. Welcome to another edition of Politics Done Right. I'm here with the one and only Ian Reifowitz, who is a professor at SUNY Empire State College, uh, a Daily Coast uh, contributing editor, one of the best, and the author of the Tribalization of Politics, How Rush Limbaugh's Race-Baiting Rhetoric on the Obama Presidency Paved the Way for Trump. And it is opportune that we are going to talk about this subject today, which is sort of driving the nation crazy. I actually said I was going to give this minimal time, and I mean that, but today is special because I want to kind of get it out there Get, uh, get Ian's point of view, and then we're going to move on to important issues. Ian Reifowitz, welcome to Politics Done Right. Uh, thank you for having me, and thank you for the, that very kind and generous introduction. It's always a pleasure to be here. Well, uh, you know, it's the, uh, actually very much warranted. But Ian, let, let me ask you a few things, Ian. Where the hell are we? Well, we are seeing the tribalization of American politics. Uh, I'm seeing that word uh, used in the last 48 hours uh, by uh, political pundits, by writers, to describe the, uh, the, the very current environment we are in, thanks to the President of the United States, Donald Trump, because of the language he used 
towards the squad, the four uh, uh, congresswomen uh, uh, who are women of color, three of whom were born in this country. He told them to go back to their countries, even of course they were born here, and he called their countries crime infested. Uh, these are racist, uh, this is racist language. He is a racist, uh, and the U.S. Congress, uh, House of Representatives voted to condemn him yesterday. That's the first time in over a century that a House of Congress has voted to condemn the remarks of a president. So to say that this is historic is accurate. Uh, the president of the United States is not doing something new here, even for himself. Remember, we keep saying this, he announced his presidential campaign by talking about Mexican immigrants as rapists and drug dealers and killers. He talks this way because this is the kind of politician that he is. He sets out to divide Americans, to get Americans to hate one another. Uh, in some ways, it's unfair to people who are in actual tribes to, to use that language, but <laughs> the English language we have, that's, you know, we have to go with the words we've got. Uh, but this is what he does. This is, and, and in the book is what I talk about. It's what Rush Limbaugh did, and it's what Rush Limbaugh does, and, and Donald Trump picked up on this. It is the way he excites his supporters by playing and preying on their racial and cultural resentments uh, as white Americans who are afraid of, of black and brown and, and non-whites, afraid of demographic change. And the way he gets them motivated is not by talking about the money he's saving them because he's not saving them any money. He's not putting any money in their pockets unless they're in the top one or 2% uh, because that's where his tax cuts focus their benefits. He has to distract those voters thinking too much about his economic policies by getting them worked up about the brown people over there. In other words, in other words, it's a bait and switch. Exactly. He's playing them for fools. Now, um, it, it is interesting because um, uh, there were, I did a, a woman, her name is Tiffany Cross, was on MSNBC yesterday. She is the, uh, I guess, the publisher of a, a rag in D.C., and what she said is she is very happy that the media is finally calling a thing a thing. That thing being they're finally saying President, uh, President uh, Trump is a racist. And at first they would use different words like he made racial intonations. He made, you know, they, they kind of catered to it, which sort of gave him some sort of plot, his words, some plausibility of not being uh, racist. And she, she's saying exactly what you said. He didn't, he's not doing anything he hasn't done before. He hasn't really changed his rhetoric. Now, what I think it's, it's important, I, I was on Facebook this morning, and a friend of mine, when I, when I posted that, that little video snippet of what Cross said, she said, Egberto, it doesn't really matter because his people simply don't care. And what I replied to her is, you're right. His people simply don't care, but we are not pointing out that he's a racist to his people. We're pointing out that he's a racist to all those people who thought their vote didn't matter and may think their vote does not matter. If they start to see him as a, if the media points him out as a racist and they start to see him as existential for, to them, then that would put the fire under them, in my opinion, to go out there and vote. And your thoughts on that? No, I, I think what you said makes a lot of sense. I noticed something in today's New York Times, and the New York Times has been more reluctant to call him a racist. I don't know if in the news section they've ever said that he was a racist or called him a racist. Interesting, though, I noticed this morning there was an article about the Philippines where the president, uh, President Duterte, and in that headline, the headline referred to him as an unrepentant sexist. And it talked about this specific policy he had. Now, if they can call the president of the Philippines an unrepentant sexist, why can't they call Donald Trump a racist when he obviously is using racist language, making, uh, yes, racially charged, whatever you want to call it, remarks. That's a, another way of, de of defining them. But you have to also call them what they are, racist. And the point of the, of the media is supposed to be to tell the truth, not necessarily to uh, um, worry about uh, how it's going to be read by his voters or, or his supporters or his opponents, for that matter. I think no. Why do you think? Why do you think they're so hesitant to simply call a spade a spade? You know, there is you know a general sort of establishment feel to the New York Times. Uh, you know, there are different definitions of racism. I mean, I guess you can look at it a million different ways. You can you can talk about racism being actions and not words. 
I don't really subscribe to that very limited definition of racism. Um, there are, you know, people who will say, unless you, you say, I don't like this person because they are black, then you haven't crossed the line of racism that you're just using racially charged language, whatever. And, and I get that, uh, but there's, you know, there's a, there's a point at which people are not stupid. Donald Trump is not going to go out there and use the N word. And if you limit yourself to the most obvious, blatant, you know, clan uh, style rhetoric, for that to be the only kind of racism means that you're, the, the word doesn't, the word is not very useful. If that's exactly. We're speaking to uh, Ian Reifowitz, who is a professor at SUNY Empire State College, a Daily Coast contributor and author, to, uh, author of The Tribalization of Politics, How Rush Limbaugh's Race Baiting Rhetoric on the Obama Presidency Paved the Way for Trump. And this is a book here. Folks, let me tell you, uh, all that we're seeing now is not only documented in this book, but it's explained in this book. The mechanics of what's being done here uh, is well uh, thought out and well expressed in Ian's book. It is something probably you should get for quite a few of your friends, including some of your friends that uh, subscribe to Trump's tenets, if you will. Because I think after reading this book, this book isn't, uh, the, the way I see it, I don't think this book is written solely for the person who is, uh, you know, to enlighten the pro progressive. I think a good, stable conservative who still has an affinity for Trump could get a bit out of this because that's just how well it's written. Now, Ian, let me ask you another question. Why is it? that you think a large percentage of those people who should know better, meaning many Republicans who should know better, many business persons who should know better, why is it that they are not coming out strongly, not specifically to condemn this guy, but to weaken this guy's position, which would be self-condemning, if you will? Well, I, I mean, you're talking about... Uh members of the political establishment or the business establishment, not the average... Uh, right. Uh, I mean, people that, are, that know better. People that really themselves, we know, are not racist. Right. The answer to that is that he has delivered on at least some of their priorities. Simply by being in the White House, he allows them to con uh, uh, confirm judges, two to, the, two to the Supreme Court, right? We have uh, Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Gorsuch. The, latter, the former was in a seat stolen... Uh, from uh, Barack Obama's nominee. Uh, that's what their interests are. Cutting taxes for the rich, getting people on the, on the federal and on the Supreme Courts to uh, back conservative positions on social issues, but probably more importantly, to back conservative issues on uh, conservative uh, ideas and politics on economic issues, on issues of regulation, and on issues like gerrymandering and voting rights, which help perpetuate further Republican victories. They are playing that game. They are holding their nose. They are unprincipled. They believe that the only principle that matters are conservative victories that help line their pockets. And uh, they are willing to go along with Trump in order to do that. Some have turned away from him, but uh, you know, and we can respect that. People like Charlie Sykes, people like Bill Kristol, who may have been wrong over the years on many issues, but have shown some principles. Uh, I'm very disappointed in Mitt Romney. I don't understand what the purpose of Mitt, in Mitt Romney's mind of running for the Senate at his age with his record of accomplishment as a former uh, a major party nominee. What was the purpose of going to the United States Senate from a red state other than to stand up to Donald Trump, other than to provide a Republican alternative to Donald Trump to rally around? I'm very disappointed, frankly, in, in his performance. Yeah, that is sad. So... Um what do you think is the outcome? Uh, I, I have some ideas, but I'd rather hear yours first. I, act, I believe this is well calculated. I think this is well timed. And I think if the Democrats play it wrong, they lose. I think you're right. Uh, it is not an accident that all of these tweets have taken out of the media the fact that Trump caved on the census question. I mean, he had to. He had no choice, you know, according to the Supreme Court's decision. But he caved on the census question, which was a major, major defeat for the white nationalists, you know, keep America white uh, people who, who back him. Uh, they could have been 
very dis- disenfranchised, uh, disappointed in him. Instead, he pivots from that uh, loss to another way of revving up that same base with, uh, with this go back to your country, you know, you brown women remarks. He's not stupid when it comes to the politics of resentment, when it comes to the tribalization of politics. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows the only way he can win the presidency again is by maximizing that the racially resentful white base and the other, you know, the other people who maybe don't uh, love that but are willing to go along with it because they see him as fighting for them or whatever. He's not going to get more than 45, 46 percent of the popular vote, uh, uh, maybe 47 if he, you know, if he's lucky. Uh, depending on if there's third party candidates, maybe he can eke out another electoral college victory. He's never going to be a landslide president, despite the fact that he has said he won in a landslide. But he's also said a lot of other things that, that are lies. Uh, so the only way he can win is to rev up the base and hope to draw another inside straight like he did last time. But beyond that, he also doesn't know any way of doing things other than the way he has been doing them. The man is 71 years old. He's not going to change. This is who he is. He won the presidency this way once. Why not try it again? It is sad because for someone as inept as he is, that he could actually win again. I'm more concerned now about the remnants of what's left after he's gone. After all, uh, if he gets uh, 45% of the vote, that simply tells me that a large percentage of Americans are either willfully ignorant, uh, delusional, or... And I I, 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 I try to say this when I'm speaking to the other side with a, some modicum of respect, but you have to wonder how they process information in their heads uh, to, to somehow fall for somebody or continue to elect somebody like this. And if that is the case, if he's elected, there's a hell of a lot more repair in this country that, that'll come after those four years. Oh, absolutely. I mean, one thing we have to bear in mind is that there are about 40 percent of the voters who will vote for a Republican no matter who the candidate is. Right. Even, you know, when, when Trump won in 2016, he got just about the same percentage of the white vote that Mitt Romney did. I think he did one percent better among whites overall. Uh, so, you know, some of it is the fact that any Republican simply starts out at about 40. Uh, it's just a matter of how many of the people who end up voting for him are voting for him in spite of his racism and his and his race baiting and how many of them are voting for it because they like it right i and I, I i i am i i really think after speaking to a lot of his voters and people i would likely vote with him before i think a lot of these people are voting for him in spite of uh in spite of him being a racist in other words they are so attached to the republican party and they are so dis uh dis disenchanted with their impression of what the Democratic Party represents, that they see the Republican Party as the better of two evils. And I think that is just how some Democrats look at the Republican Party, that it is, uh, again, as a Democratic Party, that it's the better of two evils, so they'll, they'll vote Democratic. I think one of the things that we have to do here in independent media is just be able to tell things the way that they are and allow folks to get past that, get past that thing where it's tribal, where it comes to uh, political parties, because that not being the case, we're killing the country. And we've seen this happen in other countries. No, you're absolutely right. And I do think there, there are ways forward. And, and I do think Barack Obama has provided some examples of that. And that's what I wrote about in my previous book, which yes. was Obama's ideas. He understood how to use empathy. And, and I think he was sincere. I mean, if you read his, his writings going back to the early 90s when he wasn't interested in politics, or if he was, it was a long game. He talked right. a lot about empathy. He would, be, he would talk to people and say, look, I understand that, that you working class white voters, for example, don't feel their position is so great and they have suffered from X and Y and Z and I understand their pain. And by saying that, they, those people listening to him can say, oh, wow, this is a guy who's not just against me, but he understands where I'm coming from. And then the next part of his speech, he can say, and so have, you know, so have Americans of color suffered. They've suffered from X and Y and Z. And those people that he just showed empathy for, for those white working class voters feel 
that he cares about them. So they're saying to themselves, maybe I'm more going to be a little more willing to listen to the other things he has to say. And then right. those people can feel more empathy for the Americans of color that Obama is talking about in the next sentence and in the next paragraph. That's how you repair tribalization. I do believe that Barack Obama has shown us how to do this, both in terms of political success, right? He won the presidency twice with more than 50% of the, of the popular vote. Uh, and not that every person in America has the uh, strength of, of character of Barack Obama, but the, mo the more you and I and people out there who want to reach out can, can, can model his behavior, I think the more success we'll have not only in reaching uh, voters in terms of winning elections, but just in terms of, of making our society one in which there is more empathy, when the, in which there is a, it will be a better place to live. Right. I, I, I agree uh, completely. And, and that is something that we must work on. That is something that is my passion. I have the phrase that I always use. When we unite the ghettos, the barrios, and Appalachia, we would have won. And in effect, that is exactly what we work towards. We got to put all these people together because you know what? Uh, uh, the fight, the, the just continual fighting a 50-50 or 49-51 country just doesn't work. So uh, Ian is the author of The Tribalization of Politics, How Rush Limbaugh's Race-Baiting Rhetoric on the Obama Presidency Paved the Way for Trump. This book is prescient. This book uh, illustrates exactly what, what happened, what is happening, and you know what? By inference, what is likely to happen. Ian Reifowitz, uh, it's been my pleasure having you on Politics Done Right. It's always a pleasure for me too, Egberto. Thank you. I'm pretty sure you enjoyed those two interviews. Folks, please remember... Get ready. Super Tuesday is when again? Tuesday. Tuesday coming up. Be, be cognizant that there's going to be a whole lot of spinning going on. If Bernie wins or Elizabeth wins, they're going to try to make it into some sort of a, oh my God, the socialists have won. Don't fall for any of that. We are serving the people. We are here to ensure the people get what the people want, what the people are asking for, what the people need. Let's go out there, vote progressive, vote with our minds, and in as much as it, it's not in the nature of many, you have to become fishers of people. You have to tell our message catered to those who we're talking to. My name is Egberto Willis, and you know how I end this, baby. I am what? Out!